In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the Lorentz model of refractive index. And this is a discussion that joins two things we've talked about so far in this class. We've talked at the atomic level of how electron clouds will shake using a driven oscillator model, and I'll go through this in a second. And we've also more recently talked about how plane waves would travel in dielectrics, materials where electron clouds are present and are free to move in response to applied electric fields. And I'll go through this in a moment as well. So we have two different strains of math and modeling physics that we need to join together in order to get a mathematical model for the way polarization depends upon electric field. Let's go over these first. We've studied a driven oscillator model where we apply an external electric field, I've called that E external, and that E external is given by some constant vector direction and amount, and then a sinusoidal time dependence. So that's the double arrow pointing this way indicating oscillation. Our standard model is that we have a little red nucleus here in the middle, and then a blue electron cloud, a sphere, and that the center of mass of that sphere moves back and forth in time with the applied, as the applied electric field uh, acts upon it. And the displacement of that center of mass we have we called by the position variable u. So there's a position vector u of t, which we solved for in terms of the applied external electric field. And this depended on a couple of things. First of all, the displacement amplitude was proportional to the amplitude of the applied external field but it was also proportional to some fundamental properties of the electron, its charge and its mass. And then it was related to, th to three properties of the system. One omega naught had to do with the attraction of the nucleus upon the electron cloud, so that gave us an omega naught. Omega is the frequency of the applied electric field, and gamma is a somewhat empirical damping term which has to do with the fact that as you shake an electron cloud you will radiate energy away and you will therefore lose energy. So this is our damping term, our loss term, gamma. This tells us a microscopic model for how electric charge will move in response to an applied field. And one thing I do want to emphasize here is that instead of writing a formula for the position of the electron cloud center as a function of time, we could just as well write an expression for lowercase script p, the dipole moment as a function of time. And that dipole moment is simply the displacement of the charge times the amount of charge. So the dipole moment as a function of time would be the charge displaced is minus e, and the displacement itself is that same u of t. And that immediately allows us, let's write it out explicitly here, and I'll just make it happen. So there's the formula for the dipole moment induced as a function of time given an applied external electric field. So this is a single dipole moment on the right hand side, when we considered plane waves and dielectrics, we thought about the density of dipole moments, and we called that by capital Roman letter P. And what the consequence of that was, if you look back, is that the dipole moment per unit volume divided by a constant was directly proportional to the electric field. This is an assumption that we can make that if you apply an electric field, you will get an induced amount of dipole moment per unit volume. And this, this simple form here, where it's a linear proportionality, is something we'll talk about elsewhere. For the moment, let's just take this formula as it is and say that under a wide range of applicable situations in optics, you can say that the induced dipole moment per unit volume is linearly proportional with no spatial variation within, say, a piece of glass upon the electric field. Here I want to emphasize that I'm subscripting the electric field as E average. We're going to talk about this more elsewhere. 
for the moment, I just want to say that this is the this is the average electric field, spatially average over a volume larger than the volume of one atom. And E average is not exactly the same as E external, although in this derivation, we're not going to push on the differences, but I want to flag that for later in the course. And the importance of this ver of this value chi here is that once you know chi, as we saw in earlier considerations, you can solve for the refractive index, say, of a piece of glass. So this knowing what chi is is very important. And we want to have a microscopic model for this macroscopic property of the proportionality between induced dipole moment and electric field. Well, we're pretty close already. We've already got a microscopic formula for the induced a single dipole moment from one atom. And you've got exactly that same dependence here. We have an E on the right and a dipole-ish thing on the left. The only thing we have to do is introduce just another consideration. It's not really a new equation. We're going to introduce a variable called eta, Greek letter eta. And that's the number of atoms per unit volume. And by that, we really mean the number of polarizable atoms per unit volume. And so we often call this the number density. Number density. So if eta is the number density, then the only thing we have to do to get dipole moment per unit volume, dipole moment density, is multiply eta by lowercase p. And then to get p over epsilon naught, we of course just divide by that epsilon naught. So we can combine all of this stuff down here and we'll get the following equation. We will now have our microscopic model. We'll say that capital P, the polarization divided by epsilon naught, since that's what we have up here, that equals eta times all of these guys, eta e squared over massive electron and then the epsilon naught we're going to put over here. So this is all in the numerator. Divided by same denominator. And then times the external electric field. Now we make a relationship between these two equations and we say that if we are in what's called the dilute limit, if there aren't that many atoms and they don't experience electric fields of their neighbors very much, and this is typically the case when you have a gas, and we'll study this for now and we'll talk about this dilute limit more in class, but in that dilute limit, what we are mathematically asserting is that the average electric field in the glass averaged over a volume larger than one atom can be approximated, approximately equal to E external, the light field that you sent into the glass. So in other words, the response of the material generates electric fields due to electrons separated from their host atoms that are small compared to the applied electric field that started all the motion. And so we can just replace both of these two subscripted E's with just a variable that we just call E with the understanding of the approximations that we've made. And if we can do that, then we now have P over epsilon naught equals chi times an E, and we have P over epsilon naught equals this whole big thing times an E. And that just that must mean that they're equal to each other. We've now got an expression for chi. Chi now equals this quantity here. So we've now modeled the susceptibility of the material in terms of microscopic properties, which was our goal this quantity that I'm drawing a box around here, I'm going to substitute the expression K 
capital omega squared for all of this because the these are constants of our problem once we've chosen a particular material. These things over here, on the other hand, are not constants of the problem. We could shine different colors of light, different omegas on this glass, and the response of the material will apparently be different because that will affect this denominator down here. Just as a closer for this discussion, remember that n squared equals 1 plus chi, like we've already noted over here, and in the dilute limit, where the response of the material is quite small, the refractive indices of gases are usually very close to 1, so chi is a small number much less than 1, we can say that n is, of course, ident is exactly equal to the square root of 1 plus chi, but in the limit where chi is quite small, that's approximately equal to i plus one-half of chi. And so now we've got a model where we've got frequency-dependent response of the material, and that Im instantly gives us frequency-dependent response of the refractive index. As we will discuss in class, this leads to a sort of behavior where versus frequency if we consider a resonant frequency omega naught and we're plotting on this side here the real part of the refractive index minus one we get a certain we get a type of behavior that looks something like this it rises up like this and that's what this denominator is doing as you approach omega equals omega naught from the left this is what it's doing as you ap approach omega equals omega naught from the right, and the actual behavior of the refractive index is to depart from that a little bit and trace out this solid red curve with this sort of sawtooth behavior. And as we will discuss elsewhere, this really is the sort of behavior that real materials, including solid materials that are not dilute, do around their electronic resonances. You see the refractive index tending to grow as frequency increases, but then doing these little sawtooths when the material hits resonances.